Uh, please turn your phone on silent. Okay, so everyone. This uh, Shabbat uh, has a title. There are certain Shabbatot of the year that carry a title with them. So we have uh, Shabbat Breshit, when we read about creation, the beginning of the Torah. And then we have uh, Shabbat Shira, when we read about the song of Yamsu. There's a Shabbat called Shabbat Chazon. Because of the Haftorah of the Novi Yeshayahu, which begins Chazon Yeshayo Ben Omot Asher Chazal Yerushalayim. But uh, the Chazon is a, a positive word in Hebrew, it's not a negative word. For instance, in Davening, we say, We don't say, We say, uh, And Chazon is therefore usually translated and in English as being a vision. Basically, a vision also is a positive word in English. We ask for leaders with vision. We ask for uh, 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 people that have vision, have a purpose in life. Yet uh, the Haftorah itself is, uh, put it mildly, uh, one of the most brutal Haftorahs that we read. And the Navi uh, spares no one. Jeremiah? No, Isaiah. Isaiah. And the Navi points out every defect in society, in Jewish society. Corruption, paganism, <laughs> sensuousness, violation of the Torah, lack of trust one with another a point that I've discussed with you before as being the basis for the destruction of society. You can't trust anybody. The basis of society is that we trust each other. You don't. So why is it called chazon? So many before Shem say, it's called Chazon because of the positive verses that appear in the Haftorah. Every uh, prophecy, even of ultimate doom, contains within it the seeds of comfort. There's nothing that's 100% negative in Tanakh. So, Sion be Mishpat Tipode, Mishavel Bitzdoko, Zion will be redeemed. Justice, righteousness, goodness. So it's called Chazon because of the few psukim that are positive in the Haftorah. Our custom is to read that Haftorah with the melody of Eicha, except for these few psukim, which we read with the 
regular melody, so to speak, of the prophets. But that's at best uh, a technical answer. So if we think about it more deeply, uh, uh, we can see an element of vision uh, which is required in order for us to obtain any sort of comfort or consolation. The Novi says, read Darkech Bagai. Look at your path in the valley. Where did you go? You have to review the past. What went wrong? Why did it go wrong? And if you do so, then you're a rational person. Uh, you will not repeat those errors because it didn't work. It only brought you disaster. And we see this in the opening psukim of the Parsha. Moshe Rabbeinu, when we first meet him, uh, he has a speech impediment. <laughs> I'm not a man of words. So we don't know quite what the impediment was, but it sounds like he stammered. But he's certainly not an orator. And he uses that as an excuse. He said, don't send me, send Aaron, send someone that can talk. <laughs> it's useless to send a stammerer. And here, in the final book of the Chumash, uh, Moshe unloads a speech and no rabbi could get away with it today. And a whole chumash that Moshe repeats, explains, and chastises. Tosicha describes evil events that will occur. The Parsha Hazinu, which is all of Jewish history, blessings in the Zosabrocha. It's all out of the character of Moshe. Moshe is a man of few words. He said, he said it, I, I don't have nothing to say. And here he has everything to say. So the Mephorshim comment here, that uh, there is the uh, public persona of a leader, which is usually carefully cultivated. And then there's the reality of the leader. Sometimes they are almost the same. Sometimes they are uh, diametrically opposite to each other. So how do you know who Moshe is? Which Moshe is this? And of course, you all point out that in Moshe's words, his love for the Jewish people is apparent. It's unmitigated. And therefore, you know, if one loves somebody and one is bound eternally to that person, uh, one can say, uh, 
one can recall events that are not necessarily complementary to that person. In the United States, uh, in the entertainment world, there was something called a roast. It's not chicken. But they want to honor somebody. Usually an entertainer. So they hire six, eight other entertainers who make fun of him. Roast. That's the roast. They point out everything that's wrong with him. They point out all of his errors. And at the end, they say, what a great guy he is. How wonderful he is. He just said that he was... Uh, you know, <laughs> he counted all the times that he failed. That uh, he was not successful. The answer is... that a roast is positive and an op-ed opinion in the paper is not. It's coming for a different purpose. The roast is coming to show that in spite of all human failings, in spite of the weaknesses of human beings, it's a fine person. It's a person that has contributed to the advancement of society, is a person that has entertained people, is a person that is very charitable, whatever. So, uh, you know, the ultimate roast is the hespid that's set on the person, right? The eulogy. Because we're trying to see out of the mass of experience which every human life has, what are the positive points that make this person special and which drive his memory forward for us? And to do so, many times we have to point out weaknesses of character that were overcome. So Moshe, when he wants to review 40 years of the Jewish people under his leadership, Moshe does not spare one bit the recall of criticism and of the weaknesses of the Jewish people. Moshe is very strong. Mamri from the first day, I know you, you're rebellious. But the Rognu be all Echem, you're always moping in your tents. You're not in people that are not satisfied. You're ungrateful. And according to the first Rashi here in Dvorim, when Moshe mentions all of these places, Uh, they were all places where sins were to place. Moshe begins by uh, recall, uh, recall, recalling for them the golden calf, the, the waters, and he will admit later his own failing. And that he can't go there to Israel. Because Moshe's love for the Jewish people is such that all of this can be digested and all of it can be assessed and on that basis improvement can occur. There were two systems in the, for instance, uh, 
the American educational system. I don't know we were in Israel. But when I went to public school, I had the Miss McCarthy in second grade. If you got a 67 on the spelling test, you got a 67. She didn't say, well, on the curve, and maybe spelling is not your thing, maybe you're ADD. She didn't say any of that. She said you did poorly. And if you did poorly, then you should try and do better. You should try and improve because it's not acceptable. The second stream in American education today is you can graduate from 12th grade and now not know how to read or write. They just pass you through the system. Doesn't make a difference whether you know or not. Because if you give a, a child a bad grade, then somehow you damage the psyche of that child forever. But that child will never know how to read or write to be a success in life. So Moshe points out where we went wrong. Moshe is not here to give a uh, valedictory address as to how great the Jewish people are. Because rarely do improvements occur when that happens. The Farshim say it's a halacha in Milchus Avelis that uh, at a uh, funeral, the uh, person that uh, delivers the eulogy is allowed to exaggerate. He's allowed to say great things about the person that really are not true. There's a whole discussion in Allah as to why that should be. Because uh, we basically subscribe to the idea of midvar sheker tirchok. We don't... Uh, yeah, that's what uh, Bullock said to Bilam. You don't want to curse them, okay, but don't bless them. Out now. I've left things for your lunch. So, so one of the, the interesting thing in the Gesher Chaim, he says, Enjoy yourself. The person now has passed away. He can never improve. You can never get better. That opportunity is gone because the store is closed. The market is closed. So therefore, criticizing him can do no good because he can do no better. So for the overall society and the family, it's softer to let it go. But Moshe is talking to a living entity, he's talking to the Jewish people. What does God want from you? What type of behavior do we want from you? I have to tell you what we want. I'm not going to pay you... Uh, outlandish compliments that you don't deserve because you don't improve that way. If you saw Salanta used to say that the, the Posik in Mizmur Shuli Omashabos says, Bakomi Malai Mareim Tishmana Oznoi. When those who want to criticize me stand up and say so, Tishmana Oznoi. Give me the strength to be able to hear what they have to say. 
because it's very hard to hear criticism. Especially when we feel that criticism is unjustified or personal or motivated by all sorts of non-kosher factors. But Moshe says it. Moshe says it because he loves the Jewish people. He wants them to improve. He wants Joshua's generation to be better than his generation. And that's why the Navi said, The honor of the second temple can be greater than that of the first temple. How can it be greater? When the second temple was missing uh, five uh, miraculous uh, artifacts and uh, events, but we want it to be better. We don't want the second temple to repeat the errors of the first. So we have to say what the errors of the first were. And that's the job of the Novi. So when the Novi says, Chazon, I have a vision, he's talking long term. <coughs> The vision is that somehow there will be always be not just room for improvement, but improvement itself. Things will be better. Now, every generation feels that things are worse. The good old days. But for instance, if we look uh, at the state of the Jewish people now, and the state of the Jewish people a hundred years ago. So in spite of the terrible events that have occurred within this past century, the Jewish people are bigger, stronger, more vital, I would say more Torah than, than they were a hundred years ago. But you have to have that sense of vision to be able to see how things can improve, how we can push it forward. And that is part of the product of knowing what went wrong before, of knowing what our weaknesses are. And therefore you can have in the same chapter as we will have in Tanakh, uh, the uh, most brutal description of the destruction of Judah and then the most glorious vision of the rebuilding of the Jewish people and of Jerusalem and eventually of the temple. So how does it go together? That's the whole secret of the Torah. All of it goes together. It's the whole package. That's what Chazal said, meant when they said that, uh, you know, uh, we have Atbash, we have uh, the first day of Pesach is the day of Tisha B'Av. The day can be Tisha B'Av, the day can be uh, Yitzhak Mitzrayim. The day can be our enemy flows, and the day can be a destruction. It's how we will do it, deal with it, how we will accomplish things, what we will push, what we learn from the past. Part of the problem is that uh, the past is not real to us. Everybody creates their own past. I remember uh, two classmates of mine and I were discussing our years in the yeshiva. And when it was over, I said to them, you know, we went to three different yeshivas. 
They saw what they wanted to see. And I saw what I wanted to see. They're not the purveyors of falsehoods. That's what they saw. That's what they felt. So when we talk about facts, facts are always opinions. There rarely is anything that anything that solid fact. It's what the person sees. So all of Chumash Dvorim is what Moshe sees. And Moshe sees the negative part just as easily as he saw the positive part. Because the negative part is what he can build upon. What he can make them better at. There's a famous medrash that uh, Moshe appeals to heaven to let him go there to soil. And so uh, in heaven they tell him, it's all a metaphor, and, but in heaven they tell him, okay, uh, you can go, but uh, Yoshua is, uh, it's time for Yoshua to be the rabbi. So uh, you can go, but you, you know, it will give you a seat in the back. Then you pay your membership dues, and that's it. He said, great, it's good, fine. And then uh, he uh, complies, and after a few days, he comes back and he says, uh, it's time for me to depart this world. I can't do it this way. So the Medrash says, how can that be? Moshe is the most humble of all people. Moshe doesn't care whether you give him the Aliyah or not. But Moshe realizes that his ability to influence people is gone. He can't do it anymore. And if he can't do it anymore, then there's no purpose. And no purpose, then there's no life. So this Chumash Dvarin, which contains all of this enormous drama, is all to teach us that uh, we should remember how we got here and remember what went wrong. And not only dwell upon our great accomplishments, but upon the things that we didn't accomplish yet. And if we have that balance, so then it becomes a chazon, it becomes a vision. It's not a bad dream. It's not a false dream. It's the reality of what can be accomplished. That's the greatness of the Jewish people. So uh, it's a sobering week for us, but it's a necessary week because we don't want to repeat those errors again. We want to rise to the occasion. And that's what the Gomorrah means. Tisha B'Av will be yet a holiday. We'll convert what's negative to positive. That's the task that lies before us. So Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Be easy over to fast. And we'll see you next Friday, God willing. I think uh, I'm speaking tomorrow. Yes, Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom.